Oh, hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Hi, ladies. Hi, everybody. Hello. I, I was ready to give up. I couldn't get anybody. <laughs> no, I couldn't, I couldn't get, get in either. Yeah. We're all here. All right. Yeah. Hi, everybody. We're just going to give it another minute. Let people, um, our oh, S wow. people enter. We have about 70 in the meeting right now. Wow. About 20 more coming in. Hi, friends. Hello. Oh, hi. Hi. Hi, Rena. Hi, Nancy. Hi, Rena. Hey, PFP. Hi. Hey, PFP. Hi, Nancy. Hi. hi. Good evening. Hey. Hey, Paya. Hi, Betty. Hey. Andy. Jackie Hi, Brand. I'm so Hi. glad Brandon Johnson's on this call. Hi, um, Steve, Jackie Hines. And Cassandra. Hello. I hear Hello. you. Lynn. There you are. Hi, Lynn. Hi. Wow, everybody's grown out <laughs> their hair. So I don't recognize <laughs> anyone. <that one. laughs> Not me, Paya. Hello, Karen. Hi, Karen. Hi, hi. Hi. Hey, Marilyn. And Louie. Jackie. Marilyn. Oh, my God. Louie. Louie. Your hair is so Louie long. has long hair, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's a Texas dragon. Hi, Betty. Hi, hi Betty. Hi, Jackie. Jackie. There's hi, no. Hi, Barbara. Hey, Mick. Thanks for connecting. Hi, Jeannie. Hi, Pat. Are you in? Because I see Karen. Nice to see you. Hi, Hi, Ellen. Hi, Ellen. Long time no see, Ellen. There's Amanda Krauss from Camp. Yeah. Okay. Ellen Carver. Where's Mickey? Brandon, your your arms look awesome. (laughs) Your arms. Wow. Mm -hmm. all right hello everyone i'm gonna um i'm gonna mute everybody (coughs) your hellos in oh i have it yeah and you guys will be able to unmute yourselves at any time okay okay all right Thank you all for joining us tonight. Can everybody hear me? Give me a shake of the head if you can. Okay, excellent. It's so it's so weird when it goes quiet like that. So thank you for joining the fellow women of the row for an evening of firsts as we, as we celebrate Women's History Month, the pioneers and innovators of our sport, sports, and a community of amazing women. So when women come together in our community, we create a dynamic energy that can be felt long after we part and we can share with others. So we truly feel honored to have each of you with us here tonight. Um, And we are over 100 strong tonight. So pretty amazing uh, turnout. Um, I'm gonna keep my opening very short because I wanna get to everyone sharing tonight. Um, Women of the Row was born out of conversations between Mara Kennedy, if Mara wants to give a little hello, and Ellen Carver and myself with the goal of giving women a voice in the Boathouse Row history books and of the walls of the boathouses. We noticed there weren't quite as few uh, as many pictures of women on the walls as there were of men. Um, And also to provide a supportive network um, of women in our community. And so we wanted to break down those same walls um, between clubs and let everyone know that we are here to support one another's endeavors on and off the water. And so we strive to have quarterly events um, with speakers and dinners, recreational activities, and hope to ultimately have um, some service activities for our community. And our first event um, had over 80 women and we were just blown away and it's been the same ever since. And like I said, we've taken a little hiatus during this COVID-19 period and you guys show up um, and it's just amazing each time. So um, Ellen will talk a little bit at the end of the evening about our next steps and how we need you to be part of um, kind of growing and and sustaining this community. So this evening's presentation 
um, or this evening is not a presentation or a lecture in any way um, on the history of women's rowing and paddling along the Schuylkill, but it's a venue for women to share their experiences and stories that are part of our history and the shoulders that we stand on. So while we probably will learn something new tonight, the goal was really to connect with one another and provide an opportunity to correlate names with faces. Um, now more than ever, this, our sport, is a, is a way of creating connectivity and inclusion. Um, so we thought this would be a fun way um, to, to kind of delve into the history, the short history of women uh, rowing and paddling. Um, so who says there's no first left, right? I mean, I, I think a lot of us have had a lot of firsts this year alone. Um, so it's a fun way to get to know each other. And we're gonna keep this evening very casual. We'll begin with a lineup of storytellers. So we basically planted some storytellers in the first half of the program. And then we wanna open the floor to everyone else. We have some notes from your registration that um, folks noted what their firsts were. And so we'll throw them into the chat room. Um, but just a few housekeeping items to help with the sound and the flow. I'm going to keep everyone muted to eliminate any background noise, but you have the ability to unmute at any time. So um, just be reminded that any type of background noise really prevents others from being able to hear well. And if you're newer to Zoom, be sure to put your screen on gallery view. Um, that really the benefit of doing this on Zoom is seeing one another and seeing everyone's reactions to stories. And it's truly a gift. So if you're only seeing me right now, way too close up, you're in speaker view, you need to change it in the upper right hand corner, um, scroll over where it says um, speaker view to gallery view, and then you'll be able to see everyone. And it's probably about 25 people to a screen and you can scroll through uh, the four or five screens that are there. So I encourage you to keep your chat room visible off to the side and use that chat room to add comments and stories um, as speakers are sharing. And then from time to time, I'll display a few pictures. Um, so don't do anything with your screen. I'll remove it and your screen will return exactly the way it was. Um, and lastly, I just want everyone to be aware that I am recording this session. So it's available to those that weren't able to join us tonight. And of course, so we have a recorded history um, to share with, with future rowers and paddlers. So you're encouraged to add thoughts in the chat room. You're gonna have a, um, uh, an open floor towards the uh, end of the program. And I encourage you to raise your hand in the chat, raise your hand, uh, you can use that little icon um, or just speak up. We'll, we'll try to moderate as, as best we can. But again, this is supposed to be casual and we want you guys to have fun with us. So thank you for being here. And um, I think that you know we are just, we are better as we move forward together. So without hesitation, first, storyteller um, is going to be Ernie Bayer. And she's going to um, tell us a little bit about Fill Up Your Girls Rowing and uh, how we are so lucky on the road to have uh, the first women's rowing club in the US. So Ernie, over to you. Don't forget to unmute yourself. I can't see you right now. It is. I didn't see the tray bar. There it is. My tray bar was going down. I'm sorry. Um, my, my parents all, often said we should be on that, was it um, to tell the truth, where they go, what is your name? And you say Ernie Bear. And all three of us said Ernie Bear. So I am I'm Ernie Bear too. <laughs> I inherited the name. Um, for those of you who didn't know how this all started, one of the reasons Philadelphia Girls Rowing Club came to be is because the Schuylkill River stopped freezing. And the, um, the Skating and Some Humane Society, who actually used to be out of that club, their chore was during the winter to rescue people who fell through the ice. Well, what happened over the years, there was so much pollution in the river, it stopped freezing. So there was no longer any reason for them to be at this club. And they were just basically keeping a housekeeper there and occasionally men would stop in and have lunch down by the river and that was it. So my mother happened to work at the same bank as one of the chairmen of, of the Philadelphia Skating and, uh, Skating Club. And he bumped into her and said, um, by any chance, do you think you and any of your friends might be interested in, in um, maybe leasing our, our club? And my mother went, what? That's fantastic. Because my father's excuse for years about why women didn't row is, first of all, there was no spot for them to row. And there was also no boats available. So this eliminated one big thing. So then what happened, they needed boats. And the two key people in getting them equipment were Jack Kelly Sr. and Fred Placed, whom you know as Placed at Hall. 
and they basically got boats from them. They learned how to row in Penn's barge, and that's how the women got started. And from there, it basically it grew. The problem was they had no one to compete against, so everyone raced against everybody else in the club, which of course means that you end up, oh, well, I don't want to race against you because you might win, and, and oh, well, and people were careful about how they voted, but that's how the thing started. The um, founding members were girlfriends of a lot of the, the men who rode. They ended up marrying them, and you end up with names like Henwood. You end up <laughs> with names that you, you are in the history of what went on in Boathouse Row. And it is a very small community. When the, the women first started, what actually got said to my father was, how can you permit your wife to row? One gentleman came up to my father, extremely concerned, and said, Ernie, you really shouldn't permit your wife to row. I taught my wife how to row, and she got tuberculosis, and she died. And my father said, I don't think so. And he said, well, I'm sorry. They had friends whom they had had for 10 years who stopped speaking to them when women came into that boathouse. The men hadn't even known it was available. If they had known it was available, there probably wouldn't be women in the Philadelphia Girls Rowing Club today. So I think that's my three minutes. Uh, you're great. Sophie, would you like to add to the PGRC legacy? Thank you, Ernie. Sophie, on mute. How's this? There you go. Okay. This year marks 60 years of rowing for me, which is, the number is larger than some of your ages on this call. But I remember one sentence changed my life. My sister said, would you like to try rowing? That was May 1961, and I've been there ever since. And it took me three years to race the first race. And I remember racing match race and winning. And the thrill of the hunt stuck with me for a long, long time. And that was one of my first. So, uh, and, and when I joined, the club had about 13 members. The original founders, all but one, had gotten married and had children. Uh, the one unmarried one was Ruth, uh, the one childless one was Ruth Robinhold. So she stayed a member until she was almost 100 years old. Um, then gradually, more and more women would come to join, but you had to know someone to even get in the door because no one knew about rowing. So it was a word of mouth thing. And now we have between 80 and 120 members and we're strong and all except for last year, I've been on the water every year. And that's it for me. Thank you, Sophie. We're gonna turn it over to Lois Trench Hines. <laughs> here. Okay, I'm unmuted, I think, right? Yes, yes. Okay, sir. well, this is very exciting. Uh, I hope that some of our stories that we're sharing with one another are uh, both uh, educational and um, informative, but also I know many of them are going to be uh, uh, really entertaining. Uh, my history with rowing started in 1965. I had just graduated from college. I had a nice new black MG Midget, and I had a job at Smith Trench, and I was driving up Kelly Drive. When all of a sudden, over, and my top was down, it was a beautiful spring day, I turned and I saw a friend of mine that I had gone to high school and college with, with an oar on her shoulder. And I stopped my car. Now this is five o'clock rush hour. I'm on Kelly Drive. And so I said, Sandy, what are you doing? She said to me, I'm going rowing. To this day, I can't believe I said this. I didn't know that girls were allowed to row. Honk, 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 honk. Well, I said, I'll call you tonight. Went home, called Sandy, and she told me about the Philadelphia Girls Rowing Club. So actually, Sandy was dating uh, her, her, her 
the, uh, I guess her friend who is now her husband and six kids later, whom uh, George had coached, Frank Madden. Anyway, um, PGRC was the only show in town. So I took myself down there and I thoroughly enjoyed myself. Um, wonderful camaraderie, one thing or another. Well, over a period of uh, then and about, I would say in the May, uh, maybe late 80s, I'm not certain of the date, I bounced around to, I now belong to, or either belong or I've had belonged to five boathouse rows. You know, that just goes to show you how evolution takes place. Well, I was, at that time, um, I did everything I possibly could or was asked, whether it was stake boating, driving a launch, changing cotter pins, going for gas, one thing or another. And I was up at the, uh, the boardroom at number four Boathouse Row, which at the time was called the uh, United States Rowing Society. And so Lois, I, in the past, Lois, can you do this? Lois, can you do that? And I would say, yes, yes, yes. One day, I don't know what I got into, got into me, and I wasn't thinking of, uh, I'm going to be the first. They asked me to do something. And I sat there and I looked around the table. And to this day, I can't remember one person that's still alive. I said, sure, but I would prefer to do it as a member of the United States Rowing Society. Dead silence, because we had nothing but men sitting around that table. And of course, women always sat next to the wall, okay? So, and so they, I became the first woman of the United States Rowing Society. And I would say it was probably, oh, I would say it's probably uh, in the early 80s. Early 80s? No, late 70s. It was late 70s, between 73 and 79, because I know I was not dating my husband yet. Oh, I got married in 79. I'm totally mixed up with time. Don't pay any attention to me. <laughs> Betty, Dottie Brown, don't ever let me help you write your book. Right. All right. So uh, I watched, I'm about two minutes. If you want later on, I can tell you how women got into the dad veil, which is a very entertaining story. Yes, we do want you to follow up with that one. Okay, Lois? Okay. All right, thank you. All right, we're gonna turn it over to Penny Henwood and Anita Jink Sacco, and they're gonna talk about the first women in international competition, the VT8, as you may know them. Uh, Sophie was also a member of that eight, as well as Faye Donovan, who's on the line tonight as well. Um, but let's, um, Penny or Jinx, do you wanna take it? You can both talk. One of the, uh, the craziest things that I experienced going internationally for the first time was the 67 Vichy 8 <clears throat> was consisted of pretty much teenagers. We were very, very young. Uh, maybe a couple of were in their 20s. And uh, the language barrier that we experienced going internationally was something to say about the Americans because Americans only speak English. They don't speak any secondary or third languages as does Europe. And when we went to France, even if France could speak English, they didn't. Just to mess, mess us up even more. But um, I do remember Ernie's situation in the uh, train station where we're trying to locate our oars and get them transported where we needed to go. And she's speaking her high school French, trying to make this all happen. But uh, we also needed meals in the morning and meals at nighttime that Ernie and her mom both were trying to get us uh, on American food and something nutritious. Uh, there was an, also an experience where Barbara Depenaho and I went to a corner little grocery store to get yogurt for Barbara. Not only did we find the yogurt, but we found Philadelphia brand cream cheese at the same place. So uh, also Nancy Farrell managed to get Heineken beer delivered to our room. She was all of 17 years old somehow and added to our tab at the hotel. So it kept us in Heineken beer for the time frame that we were there. <laughs> so, but it was interesting because we, nobody spoke French. That's great. Thank you, Penny. Anita, do you want to add to that? Or maybe you could tell us a little bit about the story of how you actually came about getting there. 
need to make sure that you are unmuting yourself. Yeah, can't walk and chew gum. Uh, hopefully you can hear there me. You. Um, my name, uh, when I was uh, competing, was Jinx Becker. Uh, post uh, rowing, I become known as Amelia Sacco, but uh, sometimes I just signed Anita Jinx Becker Sacco. And my rowing affiliations, I started with the PGRC in 1963. Uh, I rowed there, um, was a member of the, the uh, first uh, national championship eight in 1966 when the NWR championships were first held. And then again, in a member of the eight in 1967. And following that race in Oakland, California, when we returned to Philadelphia, we pretty much thought, well, the big race is over, things are done for the year. But uh, as things progressed, we had an invitation that uh, the Bears were instrumental in getting for us to uh, row an exhibition in St. Catharines, Ontario, in the North American Rowing Championships. And from there, we received an invitation to participate in the European Rowing Championships in um, Vichy, France in 1967. Um, so we had to scramble uh, very much at the last, uh, running out of time before the, the competition began, but both we went to Vichy. And I had um, something I had come across about our experiences or observations with the competitors we faced. In the uh, eight race that we were in, uh, in Vichy, there were actually six crews. Um, Western Eastern Bloc countries, but um, this is something I had written for a, a, a sports writer a couple of years ago, and I said the trip to Vichy in 1967 was a real eye-opener, because none of us had ever been away from North America before. Um, the Russian rowers who we were going to be competing against were joyless, stocky brutes, as I recall. Uh, big, but not toned. They looked like they had been doing hard manual labor. They looked strong. Uh, they never smiled. They would not make eye contact. They were very disciplined. Um, and they were not into personal hygiene by Western standards. That was the case for uh, several of the countries that participated. Um, uh, and although this sounds prejudicial or not very uh, flattering, I would have called them uh, peasant class. Um, the Bulgarians were very much like the Russians, only shorter and stockier. And the East Germans were a better looking people. They were tall, long and lean. They looked more prosperous and more fit. And they were definitely disciplined and very focused. And it never occurred to any of us uh, in the PGRC American crew that uh, any of our competitors might be doping. But years later, you know, we have our suspicions. But um, none of the Western Bloc countries were very friendly except for the Czechs. And it was whispered that their governing bodies were feel fearful of defections. Uh, so the teams were closely watched. And at the regatta's end, all of the competitors were invited to go on a tour in the French countryside uh, with lunch included. We had uh, wonderful creamed mushrooms, as I recall, delicious green salad and French bread. And um, the Americans were just about the only ones that were participating. There were some Dutch women, I think, also. The Eastern Bloc countries all had to go home as soon as the competition was over. There was no sight saying for them. So a uh, picture was really worth a thousand words. And when I, I really came to realize how truly fortunate I was to be in my country. Thank you, Anita. That was a great account. Um, uh, some really great stories that we heard from the VT8 um, in another uh, story hour that we had. So um, I encourage you to check that out and we can uh, get that link for you. Um, but following them and standing on their shoulders were the first set of Olympians um, and Title IX were to follow. Um, so Carol Bauer is gonna talk next and tell us some of her experiences. 
Okay, well, thank you for having me on here. I'm Carol Bauer, and um, I started my rowing career at UCLA because Title IX had come in, and um, I'll explain a little bit about the early days of Title IX because it was like the beginning days of Title IX, a middle section of Title IX where it became a bit dicey. It was being pulled back someone once, and then the resurgence of Title IX in the 1990s. But anyway, um, I am like, well, first of all, I've made my, my career out of coaching. So I've been coaching a little over 40 years now. And so that's one of the benefits of Title IX also. Not only did I get the opportunity to row, but then I got the opportunity to actually make a career out of being a rowing, a collegiate rowing coach. So uh, when I first started, and I would say as a first, um, I was a group of first. You know, we, we got things started at our colleges and there's a group of women that got things going um, at their colleges. So Title IX in 1972, when it first came on, essentially said, you can participate in rowing. They didn't, it didn't say anything about equity and it certainly didn't do anything about the enforcement of the law. But if you wanted to start a rowing team and you could get the support and find a coach and stuff like that, you could get, you know, you could start your own rowing team. And that's what so many women, the first woman to make the first Olympic teams, they essentially started their own rowing programs. Um, and they generally had a male coach who came from the same university, finished his rowing career, decided to start coaching. I think the only place that had a woman at that time was the University of Pennsylvania, and they received the benefit of the woman who rode at P PGRC. And that was Joanne Iverson, who started, uh, who was the first women's coach uh, for the University of Pennsylvania. So, um, so those of us, you know, we developed a certain kind of toughness because we didn't take anything for granted. Um, the program wasn't there for us. We had to create our own programs. And, um, and that started, you know, the whole rowing association for the woman. Um, and that carried on for a little while, but the other benefit was um, when we finished rowing, what we got was the benefit of the clubs that were established. So I know I moved from Southern California to Philadelphia so I could row at Vesper because that, that was an established program. People there were training for Olympic teams. That's what I wanted to do. So, to, so Title IX got me started but it was these clubs that gave me the opportunity to excel to the Olympic level. Um, and then when you move on from there, it was in the, let's see, in the mid eighties that Title IX was taking a hit. It was a law, Grove City versus the United States. And essentially that law argued that only those programs that were federally funded at a university or college would be accountable to Title IX. And that's where women's uh, collegiate programs started to get dropped. They started to get put down to the club level. And that happened to my team at UCLA. It just got, it dropped down. And I was coaching at Penn at the time. Unfortunately, we were able to keep going as a varsity program, but it was getting pretty dicey and we were losing women's programs and therefore we were losing women's rowers um, to move on up to the international level. And then in the mid 1990s, the law came fighting back because um, essentially we got rid of the Grove City versus uh, the United States that got overturned in the mid nineties. And the enforcement part of it was um, the Equity and Athletics Disclosure Act. So it wasn't like the, the direct enforcement of the law, but it said to all athletic departments, you have to disclose how much money you spend on your men's programs and your women's programs so that recruits can see that so that uh, your students can see that, see the equity or inequity. And that's when things really started to change. And that's when um, we really saw the big burst of these uh, large rowing teams like the, you know, Ohio State or uh, you know, UVA or, you know, University of Washington. They got that boost, but it all started way back in the 70s that just said, okay, you know, if you want to row, you can row. We're not going to stop you. We're not going to support you, but we're not going to stop you. But that's what got the thing going. Wow, Carol, that is a really great recap of, of the Title IX history. Um, I'm going to have... 
I actually wrote my master's thesis on this, so <laughs> that's how I keep the numbers straight. The you need straight. to share that. Share that, Carol. We'd love to read it. Read more. Um, I'm going to have Deirdre Mullen speak next um, as a, what would, Deirdre, what would you call it? Were you the early, the intermediate? Uh, what part of the Title IX were you? Were you? I'd say uh, early. My first year of rowing was, I was a sophomore at Penn, um, and it was the, I believe, the first year, it was actually a varsity sport. It was certainly the first year that it was a full-time varsity coach, and at that point in time, Joanne was not coaching, so I guess she had, her tenure had, had ended at some point earlier, and this Dwayne Hickley was our coach. He had come down from the University of Vermont. Um, and he had a, a very able uh, U.S. Uh, national team rower uh, who, um, who helped him and helped us get started. Um, I think as much as anything else, um, we all, those of us who ended up on that team, shared um, a couple of attributes. One was curiosity, another was cluelessness. Um, we had no idea what we didn't have in many cases because we were all so new to the sport. So the fact that we couldn't access the men's rowing club, uh, we, we rowed out of bachelors. And at that point, bachelors did not have a working shower. Um, so we, we just, the whole idea of having equality of facilities, Gail Rickinson, thank you. Um, <laughs> and what the facilities was just just not anything that we were even mindful of. Um, it, you know, even even our training. I remember like one of the first practices. He says, "Okay, run two, and then we're going to come back here and do stadium steps." And and I, you know, not having any athletic background, just being lucky enough to be the right place, the right time, and the right height. Um, you know, run two and then come back to uh, two laps. No, two miles. I mean, you, you could have blown me over with a feather. I just like, what? So we were all so clueless, but within a year, I think we really started to get a feel for what this was about. There weren't that many crews around in Philadelphia. We may have been the only Philadelphia crew that year. By the time I graduated, I know St. Joe's and probably some other schools had added crews. Um, <laughs> ergometers what i mean we got i think we that was the one time we were, did have access to the men's boat, uh, rowing club um boathouse there was a uh, like two cages um that had these ergometers in them they were it, it was just you know they're, they're the same torture device just a very different setting um so a lot of a lot of newness to me a lot of things that have you know have already gone through and are in the the history books um well, I guess really, I just find it so remarkable that I was so fortunate to find rowing. It found me, um, and I just look at Division One rowing now and and just laugh at the thought that you know I could, how I ended up on a team uh, where today what these girls have to do um, to to even have that access that I just had. Um, I do want to note in terms of your your comments, Carol, which are so interesting in terms of the Title IX evolution. But um, my second year of rowing was the year that Yale, uh, the women at Yale did the Red Rose uh, activity, which I think many of you probably know about. If you don't, I would encourage you to look it up. It's a fantastic story about these women that, that walked in and disrobed in front of the athletic director and said, you know, these are the bodies that you're not taking care of because they would have to sit and wait unshowered and cold while the men showered on the way home from rowing. So it wasn't a dissimilar situation at Penn. We just <laughs> we weren't organized or thoughtful enough to do it. So we'll take, we'll take our sister's lead. And uh, within a few years, the, the addition to the Penn Boathouse uh, included the women's boathouse, but that was not during my tenure. So I had, I had some firsts. I was by no means the first, but I was part of the, the uh, initial crew. And I would say probably the beginnings of the of the title nine story um and you know what a blessing it's been thank you deirdre i'll, I'll and um well i'll first of all thank everyone that has spoken thus far um because uh, i i certainly benefited as a walk on at Rutgers. i'll insert my first uh, or one of my first as a um member of the first ncaa uh, championship for women's rowing in 97. Um, so, you know, it, being able to see that during my tenure, um, it was pretty remarkable and, and, and just, you know, an experience I'll never forget. 
Um, we are moving on to Liz Bergen. Unfortunately, we can't see Liz tonight, but we can hear her and she can hear us. So Liz, if you can go ahead and unmute. Um, Liz was the first Schuylkill Navy uh, women, uh, first woman Schuylkill Navy Commodore. Try again, Liz. There you go. It's holding for like a second and then it's uh, going back to mute. And try one more time, Liz. Yeah. Oh, there you How's go. That? We got gotcha. you. Oh. Space bar didn't work for me. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so I started rowing at the girls club in 1965. Um, Joanne Iverson um, grabbed me one of the nights I came up to the girls' club to spend some time. Both of us were dating people that were in the 60, 1964 Olympic boat. And Ted Nash had just come to town with his wife, Aldina. And Aldina had rowed at Lake Washington. So... Ted and Joanne were putting a crew together and she asked me if I wanted to row. So both my brothers had rowed. So it was in the family and I knew what it was. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then, so that was 1965, February of 65. I actually learned to row in um, Penn's tanks. So, we got started in February, started training, and, you know, that's how far back I go. Not as far as Sophie. She's got me beat by a couple of years. I forgot about the Penn Tanks. Yeah. Oh. That year was, a, a, for me, it was easy. It was February, and we were inside to learn to row. Anyway, moving along, in um, it was probably about 1969, um, the Schuylkill Navy asked, there was some kind of a crisis in this city, and um, the men's crews decided they didn't want us uh, sitting at the end of the boathouse and not be a member of Schuylkill Navy. So they asked us to start attending the meetings. And I was asked to be the representative to go from the club. And after several meetings, the secretary didn't show up one night. And they asked me if I would take the minutes. So from going to pro tem to having the girls accepted as full-fledged members of Google Navy. And then I was voted in as um as the secretary that's great. so that's how i got into the school maybe just by being the representative from the girls club from then on i i was secretary first for a couple of years i was treasurer i was vice commodore and then when it came time to be commodore there seemed to be a little rift in the in the background, but Ned Thomas was from University Barge was um, the Commodore when I was Vice Commodore and he kept telling all the men that I could do it and the letter alone, she can do it. So, and that was how I came. They did elect me to be the first woman Commodore. Now that was 1980. So it was Many, many years afterwards, when Margaret Miggs um, was elected president or Commodore of the Schuylkill Navy. That's fantastic. Thank you, Liz, and for all your, for all your service and uh, for paving the way for those that came after you. So we appreciate that. Um, we're going to turn it over to Karen Tetlow, and she's going to introduce some bachelor first, Bachelor's Barge Club firsts. Hi, um, I'm Karen Tetlow, and I started 
rowing at Bachelors back in 19, 1998. I was introduced to, to rowing by Patsy Sorry, who said, well, if you live in Philadelphia, you have to row, which was wonderful. Uh, but, and Bachelors has a couple of firsts, but before get, uh, introducing them, I'd like to give a little background. The club was founded in 1853 and is the oldest continuously operating boathouse in the country. You can see a picture, um, Jen, if, if you've got the yep. big one. And um, women in the river, on the river were mostly passengers. But that didn't mean to say that women didn't row. I've discovered that Thomas Aiken's family, the, all the women rowed, which was interesting. And here we have a picture from the archives showing, showing people, including women, uh, watching a Schuylkill Navy review. That's from the second half of the 18th century. And that's the girls club in the background. What? Uh, that's the girls club in the background. Hey, yes, yes. Um, and it's so, so busy, that river. Um, bachelor's members were all men, of course. They'd row up to East Falls, sometimes with the ladies on board, have a big meal of catfish, waffles, and mint juleps, and row back in the moonlight. Because restaurants were mostly full when they would uh, arrive, they decided to create their own upriver club. And so the button was built. It's right next to Castle Ringstetten at the end of Kelly Drive. The Button was a place of much social activity. There were dances, parties, costume affairs, and sleigh rides, where the ladies were much in evidence. We can see the next one, Jen. We will see some drawings in the logbook, hopefully. And um, the ladies, were wives and they were girlfriends. On one occasion, the ladies from the London Gaiety Company and the Marquis of Queensbury turned up. If we could see the, see the picture, Jen, we could see some drawings in the log book. I'm not gonna be able to get those. They're turning up too small. Sorry, Karen. Oh, can you make them bigger? No? <laughs> well, yeah. we'll look at them small. Well, never mind. Um, we could, there's a wonderful drawing, we can imagine, of a large boat that is a sweep boat, and one beside the person with the sweep oar, there's a wicker seat, and that's where the ladies sat. And um, the, even the coxswain had a wicker seat next to him where his lady could sit. In the Roaring Twenties, bachelor's rowers came home with Olympic medals, and E.T. Stotesbury, who was the president of bachelor's, underwrote the Stotesbury Regatta for high schools. But the following decades showed a decline in rowing, even for men. But one member stands out who cared about rowing, and that was Dr. Thomas Kerr. He was an Olympian, and he was an Olympian, and he and the Kerr Cup is named after him. In the late 60s and early 70s, he alone encouraged women to row, as we'll hear about that in a, in a moment. And fast forward to today, the button still controls bachelors and remains a men-only club uh, with just a handful of members who row. We now have a relationship with Drexel that has generated funds to restore our boathouse and its management. We're known on the boathouse row to, to we are the place to join if you want to learn to row, scull and sweep. And today about half of our members are women, 65 out of 128 paying members. So I'd like to introduce Patricia Miner. She was the first bachelor's women's captain. So Patricia, I'm yeah. right. I am here. Hello. Thanks, Karen. Um, I joined Bachelors uh, after I first started the row with um, 
Franklin, Joanne Iverson, when I was in grad school, um, she, I was down the tanks one time and then she got me introduced to PGRC and uh, I was probably for about a year, year and a half. And then I moved on down to Schlers and I believe it was around 73, something like that. Hey Pat, I, pull, your, pull your camera down a little bit. Yeah, I am. I'm in the, I, I'm in, I can't really. I, this is me. Sit on a phone but, book. Sit on it. Sit on an old phone book. <laughs> oh, you can't see me. That's it. That's it. That's it. Okay. That's good. Is that better? That's better. That's better. Okay. <laughs> Books on my lap anyway. Okay. Oh, there are probably no more than 10 of us down there. Um, Faye, Faye was the coach at that point. And if you're losing me, I hope you can still hear me because the internet connection is not good where I am. Anyway, uh, we mainly, we sculled mainly um, singles, doubles, and we had this famous quad that was so blooming heavy. We couldn't wait for the thing to sink because then it wouldn't sink and it blew our minds because it was called Titanic. Never sank. Um, Dr. Kerr was terrific in helping us. Uh, we also had a couple uh, cocktail parties where we raised money. Uh, one, the first one was for a quad. And then the second cocktail party was we raised money and also christened um, a double that we had purchased in honor of Dr. Kerr and named it Serge. He was really terrific to us. Faye worked really hard with him and I would assume with some of the bachelor guys to get some money for us. And I, I know they obviously paid for utilities, but I don't know what else they paid for because we, we worked to do, our, to, to do and to get everything for ourselves. We worked for it. When Deidre mentioned the shower, I had to burst out laughing on my own because, yeah, we had no shower down there. And I remember one fateful day that the plumbing came in. And then I guess Dr. Kerr had ordered, of all things, a slate um, uh, separator from the shower and the toilet or whatever. It must have weighed 300 pounds. And there we were, six kids uh, carrying that thing upstairs and having and helping him install it. So ultimately that day we got a shower. Um, I don't think we ever had the heat in the winter time down there. Um, we never had water in the winter time. And so it was come in, go out and row, do your weights and um, beat the heck out of there because it was so cold. Uh, there was a nice collegiality. We had a lot of uh, older women women, uh, when I talk older, I'm talking in terms of late 20s and 30s, because a lot of the, the other people on the team were some of the high school kids from Baldwin, from I think we're losing Patricia. The Mount, uh, Mount St. Joe's, and I am. Um, so, I mean, it was, they really can and certainly add a lot more light to bachelors because she was intricately involved in it. I swear we had some of the oldest equipment, but uh, there was a good collegiality among the group. That's pretty much it from me. Thank you, Patricia. Faye, do you wanna jump in, Faye Donovan? Surely, Faye Bardman Donovan. And I will, this is rather personal. Um, the, I wrote for the girls club, Ted Nash recruited me. I, taught at University of Pennsylvania and I coached four varsity sports and it was before Title IX and I was let go because the physical education requirement was dropped. So Title IX was a very important thing, but I was pre that. Anyway, I rode in the National Championship 8 at the NWRA regatta and I was very pleased about that. And the next year we won and then we were eligible to go to Vichy. However, I had already made a commitment to the United States field hockey team um, to tour Germany, England, and France and go to the world championships in field hockey. So I had to give up my seat for the eight, which, you know, you can only do one thing at one time. But I also discovered the French didn't want to speak English, even if they could. Um, I felt like I was the first female coach. I didn't know Joanne was at it full time, but I know I was the first high school coach. And our team at Baldwin School won the national championships. And Denny also uh, from Germantown Friends won the single. And we went to the Ch Colorado Springs Championships or Junior Development Camp they had. I don't even know if they had it after that or not. But that was one of my, along with winning the eights and feeling the joy of that. One of my joys was I was coaching a 
boat in an eight of eight scholars. And we actually beat Dwayne's boat of eight sweet people. And that was very exciting to me. So I'm also one of the few women who probably bought an eight as a personal boat. I bought it because Baldwin wanted to start a crew and we didn't have a boat. So I said, well, that's it. And then also Liz Bergen's husband, Mike, and my husband, Bill, also made an addition to a historical site. And I kept waiting for the police to come to shut us down. And we quickly threw some green paint on it. So hopefully they would think it was grass from across the river and they would let us have this addition to the boathouse. So that was exciting. I think Lois and I uh, ran the NWRA National Championships. I'm thinking it might've been the first time it was in Philadelphia. I'm not sure, but we made money on that and that was a good thing. Uh, I was one of the first, not one of, I was first female referee in Philadelphia and um, it may have been national, I'm not sure. Um, but of interest, I was not welcome to go to FISA to the World Championships to referee, but my husband was. So another Title IX thing that you ladies who came in later really got the benefit of the hurt that we felt. <laughs> yeah. Um, hey, do you remember, this is Lois, remember when we ran the NWRA that year, 73, um, we didn't have any money. So I went to Fred Emerson. This is Emerson Radio from um, Shoes, too. Shoes. Old Line. Shoes. Old Line. And I said, Mr. Emerson, we don't have any money. Can you loan us a thousand dollars? And he did. And after the regatta, um, I gave him a check for a thousand dollars back. And he said, I never dreamed I would see this. And so, you know, we paid our debts, you know, but uh, I mean, it was a little scratch. I remember, you know, we had to pick up shirts and I showed uh, the woman that lived on Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, Edna Cushmore. Yes, I always thought she was extremely wealthy. So I asked her to pick up the shirts. And so I showed her the checking account and it had $19 in it. And she looked at the checking account and she looked at me and she said, I'm to pick up the shirts. I said, yes, please, we'll pay you back. <laughs> and also, there was, there was also a group of women at PGRC who were mature. I mean, yeah. older. And yeah, I'm having a good time laughing to myself about these instances. Yeah, but they had <laughs> contacts that the, they had contacts that the young women or as women did not. And we yeah. sent them as a committee to go out and scout up money and they did a fantastic job. And then after that, we had a, a champagne cocktail party. Right. Because right. we had money left over. So yeah. they did, the mature women did a fine job. Uh, I'm thinking I was one of the first coaches on the river who had a baby lying in the, the boat. <laughs> yeah. At Sophie. He, that had to be Sophie. No, it was mine. Oh, yours. Okay. Yeah. And, and he would come to every practice and he had his lifeguard, his life jacket was bigger than he was. But that was okay. I also had a dog in the bow. And if I'd stop suddenly, she would fly into the river. And uh, this was a challenge, but it was a family thing. And then we were at the girls club the first year and then it wasn't the right time for us to be there. So I had some other place to put my eight and Dr. Kerr approached me and he asked if we would like to come there. I said, oh my, yes, we'd love to come there because we wouldn't bother anybody there. We come in, we row, we go home. We didn't shower or anything. And so we moved down there and he had these little kids build a dock, a beautiful slip that, you know, you couldn't build. You would have paid big bucks for it. He got the telephone poles there and the wood delivered. And so we made his slip and that was good. We had very few privileges. The people from the upriver, Red Sergeant, lent me his boat one time, his truck and trailer to go up to Princeton to pick up a motorboat for bachelors and it ran out of gas on the way home. I think, oh, <laughs> did we need this? Yeah. Faye, Faye, we would have to have a, I think we need to have a um, champagne cocktail party just for your firsts. It's amazing. It's, it's really fun. And you know what, some of the, some of the ideas that you just brought up just are coming up nowadays, which is why women can't stay in coaching and because it is, you do need to make it a family affair. So I think that's really important um, to note. And I think we need to explore that topic further. Anything else you want to add? And then we're going to move on. No, you should, that's probably my time. Okay. Okay. We'll get back to you. Um, Betty Ruth Walter. Is Betty Ruth on? 
I'm unmuting as you have to hear me. Okay. Uh, yes, I am Betty Ruth Walter. I am a rower and I am assuming with Karen in discussion, because she's younger than I, that I am the oldest rower, but we can't verify that at the moment. Um, I came to Philadelphia to attend the University of Pennsylvania. Most of my firsts were at Penn, such as becoming the first woman editor of the record yearbook, I was the first woman inducted into the Franklin Society. I was the woman who pushed to integrate classes for men and women to study mathematics together. That was a tough battle. <laughs> I can tell you that in 1951, Penn was not a co-educational institution. It was still called coordinated education. There was the college, which were the men, and the college for women, which, in which I studied. And uh, we were not supposed to have classes together. What, the, uh, what there was not at Penn then was sculling for women. It was unheard of. So I did participate in other sports, which I did at most of my life, which is tennis, which I still play. And I was a penguinette. If you all remember penguinettes, I swam for Penn. Uh, so rowing was not a part of my life. I was a ballet dancer. And uh, one day my husband and I were biking around uh, the river and I saw the rowers on the river. And I said, I can do that. I want to do that. So we pulled over and it was a regatta. And there was a man there and I've seen him since. He's a coach. He's an older man. And I saddled up to him and I said, I want to do that. How do I do it? And he said, looked at me and he said, well, you have to do it through a boathouse. He said, I recommend bachelors for you. And Jamie Gordon is there and he will give you a good start for rowing. That's how it all started. And I've been there a very long time since then. That was 2000. So I've been there for 21 years. I love being on the river. I am very different from all of you because I'm a lousy rower. I'm a slow rower. And the only racing I've ever done was the head of the Hosner with Carol Bauer, and I hope to see you up in Vermont this summer, Carol, again. We got washed out last year, pandemic. <laughs> uh, but I have to tell you that it is such a wonderful experience being on the water and enjoying the beauty of the flora and the fauna and the little turtle families and just the peace of it all is really wonderful. And the Bachelors has been a wonderful boathouse for me. They're just terrific people in the, in the boathouse. And they don't seem to penalize me for not being the fastest rower in the world. <laughs> people help me. They're kind. There's great camaraderie. There's a nice shower these days. <laughs> and I thank them all for the help for getting me in my boat and on the river. By the way, my boat is the canal. Uh, and the, thank you, Carol. That was nice of what you wrote. <laughs> and, and the boathouse is, uh, uh, oh, she interrupted my thought. I wanted to tell you, though, that uh, I've made so many friends through the boathouse. And I, I'm coming back. <laughs> I'll be back this summer. And I thank all the people who so graciously, I cannot tell you how kind everyone is to me, helping me with the boat and the work. I am 86 now, so you know, I need a little help to get on the river. Oh, and I have to tell you about uh, Sal Buell, because Sal Buell is five years older than I. And I loved having her there because we were kind of together as the older rowers. And um, I will miss her very much, not seeing thank her anymore. Thank you. And uh, I thank all the ladies who helped me and just don't look when I'm getting into the boat and getting out of the boat, boat. but I will. Thank, thank you, Betty. You for that. Thank you, Jen, for putting, and Karen, for putting this together. It's really quite interesting. Good. Oh, I, I also want to tell you the Red Rose Crew, the book, is excellent 
-hmm. But Dottie Brown's book is better. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Betty Ruth. That was beautiful. We're going to move over to Ann Cutler, uh, one of the first, uh, is the first member of University Barge Club. Ann? Oh, hi, everybody. Thanks, uh, thanks for putting this uh, together, Jen. Um, after our um, dry run the other night, I just felt very privileged to be in in the uh, company of these fine, fine women. Um, I have a little different background. I, I'm 62 now and I started competing in sports um, when I was three and in, in the Sokol program. And, my, and I, I didn't have any issue with being able to compete my, my entire life, All right? So my mother was a semi-pro baseball and basketball player. So if you, you ever saw that movie, A League of Their Own, my mother yes. was in that league. Um, she was one of the armorettes and my father was a uh, basketball official and a gymnast. So I just grew up in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. We didn't ever feel, we always had access to anything we wanted, equal competition, equipment, equal time. Um, so I, I was very fortunate and I didn't realize it, of course, at that time, all through high school. Um, when I got to college, I went to college to play volleyball and I got injured and I was in the gym and somebody came up to me and said, hey, how would you like to row? And I said, how would I like to what, right? Uh, you know, rowing to me was that boathouse place on the way to go see the baseball games, you know, at Veterans Stadium. But um, anyway, so I said, sure, I'll give it a try and uh, loved it. So I'm in my that's my 43rd year now of rowing and uh, have a lot of stories to tell. Uh, but my firsts are in GW. Um, thank, thanks a lot to Lynn George, who was the athletic director. Uh, and for the younger people, there was, um, there was the NCAA for the men and the AIAW for the women. So there was a, a, a men's athletic director and, and a women's athletic director in the big universities, separate budgets, separate kind of everything, separate but equal, right? And the rowing team, we were fully funded. And I was one of the first women that got Title IX scholarship money in 19. So that would have been right after 78, it was passed. It was like the next semester. <laughs> You know, I, I got money, you know, for, for my education, which, uh, which was just a tremendous thing. Um, and then during my college years, I, comp I was one of the first, in, the, in one of the first boats that competed at the Dad Vale. And I remember my coach was a female and when she heard, I could still remember being at Thompson's Boat Center in our bay and she coming up to us at the beginning of one practice and she's saying, it's a great day, you know, the women have been invited to compete in the Danville and guess what, we're going. <laughs> and I didn't really, to me, having never been discriminated against up till then, I, I still hadn't comprehended what that meant. Um, fast forward, um, really until I came to Philadelphia was the first time that I felt discriminated against um, by the men, right? And it was just totally foreign to me. And I never let it, um, never let it get in the way. I always asked for what I needed. Um, and, and I think I saw Liesl on here. You know, we had the support that we needed from Jack Kelly and Jim Barker and uh, Joe Gripe. So granted, there weren't as many opportunities in the women's groups back then in the clubs didn't get together and form like a really good, you know, uh, composite type, type, type boats, but that's okay. You know, it's all part of, uh, all part of the development. And then the UBC thing came about when I was, I think it was 1988, the fall of 88, I had been in some sort of a master's group with them and I really enjoyed the time and I had said to Christopher Blackwall I said hey <laughs> if you ever take women you know let me know give me a call so a couple of years later they called me and said hey we would like to formally and you know have you as our first female member there was some other woman that was rowing there before 
um, but it was presented to me as that I would be my, uh, like the first um, member. And I told them I didn't need much. I just give me a rack to put my boat in and a place to go to the bathroom and fill up my water bottle. I'll be cool. I just wanted, I love the atmosphere there. And um, so anyway, that's how I became that member. And then when I was done competing, I turned then to giving back, which is when I became a referee. And I had the opportunity to, um, over here, I live in New Jersey. Um, I had the opportunity, I got a call one day by one of the uh, freeholders to say, hey, you row, don't you? I said, yeah, I do, why? He said, well, we wanna build a boathouse, can you help us? And I thought for a couple of seconds and I said, sure. <laughs> So that was a six-year uh, six uh, project, and Jen then benefited from that. She was one of the first um, coaches um, on the river. But giving it a female perspective, I, by that time, you know, had been pushing in my community for equity and um, because I realized people did not have my background, and I thought that I had an obligation to give back. Um, but there are, on a daily basis, we have about 400 young people rowing out of the boathouse and over half of them are females. Many of them have gone on um, to get scholarship money and have that opportunity. So um, it was such a privilege um, to be part of that. So um, Thank you. Nothing, nothing, hopefully no more firsts on the horizon. I kind of want to. I was lucky I was able to row all last year through the pandemic because our boathouse allowed us to row singles. So. Thank you, Anne, yeah. that was beautiful. Um, and, and so much more to follow up with in, in what you just said. Yeah, and uh, I got a lot of stories to tell, but. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna hop to the other side of the river um, and our uh, sisters on the water, um, the Dragon Boaters. Um, Anne Matthews, can you lead that conversation? Yep. Hi, um, my name, <clears throat> excuse me, is Ann Matthews, and um, I'm. I would like to give a shout out to the whole bunch of the members of my team that are on this Zoom. <clears throat> we have um, we have Susan O'Brien, who was our first president. She's an audience member. Jackie Himes, who was our first manager and also rode out of PGRC. She was our manager for. A, about 18 years, I think. Um, and then also speaking with me are Betty Solly and Jean Ettinger. So yes, we are the, uh, the people who keep our boats on the other side of the river and we use oars rather than paddles. We don't have a boathouse. In fact, much of the time we don't even have porta potties over there. But we do love being out on the water and uh, we love the camaraderie of our sport. My particular start with dragon boating was back in 2001 uh, when as a, uh, in my third year of being a breast cancer survivor, I saw a flyer about exercise for women who have had breast cancer and it was being offered at a gym in our area. So I went to it and lo and behold, it was actually uh, sponsored by somebody who was trying to form the first breast cancer survivor crew of dragon boaters in Philadelphia. And so I had been somebody who used to drive along the river and think how nice it would be to be, to be down there on the river as one of those rowers, but had no idea how to go about it. And here was an opportunity afforded to me by my breast cancer to actually be down on the water and, and, and have my experience. And so that's how I got started in dragon boating. The uh, team that um, I'm a member of, Philadelphia Flying Phoenix, is one of six teams, at least six teams on the other side of the river. Three are all women. Three are mixed teams. On the women's teams, there's one that's all breast cancer survivors, another one that does not have any breast cancer survivor crew, and then my team, Philadelphia Flying Phoenix, which comprises both women who have not had breast cancer and women who have. So we are actually the descendant of the first women's dragon boat team in Philadelphia. 
that was called Philadelphia Women's Dragon Boat Association. They formed in 97 and our crew against the wind breast cancer survivors that I was an original member of was part of that original women's team, Philadelphia Women's Dragon Boat team. In 2003, we formed, um, well, actually in 2003, the woman who had founded our team told us at one of our team meetings that she was leaving dragon boating. She was taking our name, our boat, and where we docked our boat with her. And so that was going to be the end of Philadelphia Women's Dragon Boat Team. We decided, the 20 or five or so of us that were members of the, of the team at that point, to start our own crew, our own team, which is called Philadelphia Fine Phoenix. And we got the name because we rose from the ashes of having our boat name and docking place taken from us. And we, uh, we knew that the phoenix was a uh, symbol in Chinese dragon, in the Chinese culture. And we envisioned that we would soar one day as dragon boaters. So that's where our name came from. Um, three years later, we won our first national championship in dragon boating for uh, women in our age division. And um, we also, I think, as one of our first were, uh, we made it part of our mission to engage in community outreach and community service, which Betty could speak to or Jean Ettinger, um, who, who are on here with me tonight. So in the end, I would describe us as a group um, where, where my first contribution was being a founding member, um, being the first coach of the team for six years, and our team first, besides the community service and the breast cancer crew, um, are uh, that we have continued to, I think, maintain a culture of, of uh, openness and communication that we felt was missing from our first particular team. So that's helped make us strong over the years. We have more than 100 members, and uh, we like to have fun. Besides the winning that we try to do locally, nationally, and internationally, we like to have fun. We have full moon paddles, where when the moon is full, we're out there on the river. And uh, yes, we do howl at the moon when we go under the bridges. <laughs> we have uh, Halloween paddles, and uh, we try to make having fun and being as fit as we can part of, of what we're all about. Um, and in that regard, I'd like to give a shout out to Cassandra, who has <clears throat> helped us bring our winter training and our off water training to a, a whole new level in the last couple of years through, and it's been a happy association with her. Thank you, Anne. Oh, I think we found our next outing, the full moon uh, paddle. If you guys give us a, a good prep during the day and then we can head out at night, that'd be perfect. Betty, can you say a few words? You have to have, you have to bring wine and snacks though. That's fine. That's part of it. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Anne has been an absolutely wonderful coach. Uh, she was my first coach and uh, we have shared experiences all over the world paddling. I think one of our most memorable was paddling uh, on the River Thames with a thousand boats in the Queen's Diamond Jubilee, if you can imagine. Um, but uh, yeah, it's been been a pretty. It's been a, a great 18 years for me paddling. I'm a former athlete. I had 13 varsity letters in college, in high school. I was on the first uh, uh, lacrosse team at uh, at Temple. Uh, if you if you went to Penn, you might remember Marie Darlington or to Ann Sage athletic directors, women athletic directors, okay? They were my buddies. So uh, we have so much more in common than we uh, actually realize um, as rowers and as paddlers. Uh, my, my particular first was, uh, Anne talked about uh, Phoenix rising from the ashes. Back in 2011, there was an enormous, well, there were three major storms in Philadelphia in 2011. And as a result of one of those storms, 800 feet of the river wall collapsed into the river and destroyed our ability to paddle. We, we had nowhere to put our boats. 
and it was the rowing community that came to our rescue. It was Christopher Blackwall, that you all know. It was John Leonard. It was Michael Cates, who enabled us to go below the falls. We were down there in that tidal schuylkill, paddling for a couple of years until we were able to uh, form, with the help of Christopher Blackwall and uh, the Access to Rowing organization, uh, to be able to convince the city that paddlers belonged on the Schuylkill just as well as any other uh, form of mobile, you know, water transport. <laughs> and in doing so, I think we, we have uh, really been, been able to um, show that <laughs> the former impression of dragon boaters was they were a bunch of gypsies on the river. We have no boat houses. We have no, you know, no facilities. Uh, we are not gypsies. There's a, there are thousands that participate in festivals every year. There are hundreds in clubs on the river, as Anne already mentioned. And uh, we're really happy that you've had us join you tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Thank you. Jean, would you like to say anything? Add sure. Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, we have a, a mission statement that includes community service. So as a result of that, I become the, the chairman of community service. And over the years, we've been doing all kinds of things, which one of the things that in our discussion on Sunday night, when we were talking, I realized how social dragon boating is as opposed to rowing. And um, we have done community service. We used to serve meals at Ron McDonald House until the health board of health got in there and said we couldn't bring the food in anymore. But we were there probably 15 or maybe even 20 years. Um, going there over our winter season when we were off the water. We've also <coughs> done things we have, we're connected to a church. One of our members, Margot Tolan, who's someplace here, hooked us up with a church on Frankfurt Avenue where we have gone there and cooked and served meals. We have also done drives for them where we've gotten um, uh, toilet paper and canned goods, et cetera, and gathered it all at the river. And then a few of our women drove it over to donate it to them. There's an organization called Ruby's Kids where we helped create, a friend of mine is the originator of that. So we um, organized with them and we've made Christmas for some kids in the, in the poor parts of Philadelphia. We have, um, I'm looking at my list here because I made it up while we were over the time. Okay, so we have also at one point we had women going into schools and reading to children. Um, we have an organization where we got a grant called Healthy Dragons, which creates an opportunity for middle school kids in four different schools to have to create teams and some of our women who volunteer to coach them and they join the regatta that's held every June, maybe not this year, but in past years, and they have come out on top a few times. So it's been good for them. Um, we also um, pack food at, at um, Project Share on Hunting Park Avenue. And um, we also do a fundraiser. So about last year, we had our, our second golf outing, which was at the Radnor Valley Country Club. And if any of you are golfers, I'm going to throw in a little thing about that. It's going to be October. What's the date, Betty? October what? 19th, I believe. Yes. I think it's, it's a Monday, October 19th at Radnor Country Club. And I will get out, we'll get out a... Um, an email to you, Jen, and maybe you can distribute mm -hmm. it around for any of you women who are golfers. We, this will be our second annual. And the good thing about golf is you can do it during the COVID. So uh, they had it in October last year and they're gonna do it again this year. Mm -hmm. I joined our team right after Anne because the Worlds were held in Philadelphia and that fall I joined. And funny thing was that um, we would never really were discriminated by by a man. We were discriminated at by by a woman when we fell apart and had to be rebuilt. So uh, that's our story. So, Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Jean. And definitely, um, we'll share any information that you want us to with the entire group because you guys are doing good work, and uh, I we we know there's power in numbers. So anything we can do to contribute. Um, I'm going to turn this um, uh, turn a little bit of different. Uh, corner here and we're going to go to Amanda Krause because she so graciously joined us this evening um, and I know we're running long but I um, definitely want 
uh, her to say a few words um, about her experience as the first CEO of U.S. Rowing. There were executive directors in the past, but she is the first CEO, and um, she started one of the first community rowing program, uh, Row New York. Um, that was an all-girls program for a number of years. So, Amanda. Yeah, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, I just, I can't tell you how moved I am to hear these stories um, because I know, um, and I was saying to Jennifer that, you know, I, I rode in the mid nineties and I know that we were standing on the shoulders of so many of you in terms of what we were able to access um, in the sport. So thank you. It's wonderful hearing your stories and I wish we were all in person with tea or wine or maybe both. Um, to, to be closer to one another. Oh, good. Some people have some, some drinks. Um, yeah, I started Row New York in 2002 to bring rowing to girls in New York City. Uh, I did that for 18 years. And then I started at uh, US Rowing in November um, as the CEO. And um, it, has, it has been very exciting and, um, you know, a lot of work. And I think I'm eager to build a relationship with this group to learn more about what the sport can do for women, what more we can do for women. Um, you know, we might as well take advantage of me being in this role and um, excited to bring the group together as much as possible. Um, I know it's getting late. So, you know, if people have questions, suggestions, I'm happy to share my, my information. I guess I, the only thing I would, I would bring up um, and not to rain on this parade at all, because I love this parade and this party, um, is that I hope that soon this group of women starts to look a bit more like this country. Um, you know, if you look around, um, it, is, it is a very white group. Um, and I think, you know, I'd love to, I'd love for this Zoom in, in five years, 10 years to better reflect this country, right? And I think there are a lot of women leading the way, I'm gonna embarrass you, Brandon, I see you here. Um, a lot of women, women of color, white women, leading the way to make our sport more diverse and inclusive. So I think as we think about how others pave the way for us, how do we pave the way to make our boathouses more diverse and more inclusive for all, all people in this country who wanna row? So um, thank you for inviting me to be a part of this. And I really could listen to these stories all night. <laughs> So thank you. Thank, thank you, Amanda, for um, really just being so thoughtful and, um, and, and being so accessible as well. I think that um, we'll be able to relay a lot of information to you and questions to you in the future. And we hope that you'll you know, take part in our quarterly events because it's just a really great group of people. Um, and I think inclusion is part of the mission um, and exactly why we're you know, trying to really- You're fading, Jen, right you're now. fading. Okay. Um, we're losing you, Jen. We're going to go to Brannon. Okay. Brannon. Hi, everyone. So, um, Amanda, thanks for calling me out because obviously now it's my turn. I feel like I had some more time. Um, but my name is Brennan Johnson. I grew up in Philly. I started um, under Mayor Street. He did an inner city learn row program that through Fairmount Park. And um, basically uh, we played a lot of basketball, but we kind of raced and we did one single race where we raced some suburban kids and I just wouldn't, I didn't want to lose my race. So Chuck Colgan, who was in FS at the time, I reached out to my dad and said I should continue. Um, I was a dancer, so I really didn't want to row, but my dad won and he still tells that story to this day since I've been in this sport since I was 14. But um, yeah, so I trained for, you know, all through high school, the trained for junior national team. I went to University of Texas on a full rowing scholarship, trained for the national team after that. And, um, you know, one of the things that kind of stuck out to me is when you've been to regatta after regatta after regatta, you just, I didn't see anyone that looks like me. And the faster I got, um, the, the more isolating it was. So I just, I knew I wanted to sort, sort of, I knew by coming home and starting 
to do some free learner row clinics that could kind of change that a little bit and just be a bridge. Um, I've had my best moments in rowing and I've had some of my worst moments in rowing and I think that's kind of life, but I think rowing is absolutely a vehicle to a better life. My, the people I've grown up with and sort of, I, I live where I grew up and one of the, the only difference between me and the people I still live with is, you know, that I had rowing and it kind of took me outside of my comfort zone. I got to see the world. And, you know, I really am passionate about providing that access to as many people as possible. Um, so I started, you know, coaching on the clinics and long story short, I am timing myself. We started BLJ Community Rowing, which was, you know, the first black owned rowing organization in the country. And it's funny because I'd been working for seven years before that even happened. And now we're 14 years in the game. And I think we're starting to really get some traction and people are asking good questions and wanting to partner, which is great. And um, I have to say, I think with the pandemic, it's been a really, really difficult year. You know, someone asked me like, what was my lesson for 2020 and survival was it? Like, I can't believe we made it. And you know, we're, we don't have walls. So we're basically outside all the time. And with the pandemic, what was a disadvantage is absolutely an advantage now. So we don't have surfaces, we're outside all the time, you know? So it's really been interesting to kind of turn on, things can turn on a dime, you know? And um, being, a, being the first black organiz, rowing organization, I've really tried to work, make sure we're mentoring. So there's a, another program in Ohio that's starting. There's someone in New Jersey, Craig at St. Benedict's. We're really starting to, I really wanted to make sure people knew I was available. So we've been trying to mentor, but I would say, you know, growing up on Boathouse Row and being in the sport since I was 14, don't ask me how old I am, it's rude. But um, I would say, I really think I got a, a really a front row seat as to how Rowan can be a vehicle for change and its differences. I think I also got to learn how, what I would do differently. And I think that absolutely informs my decisions just as a leader and how we make our decisions we move differently. And I think um, I am absolutely humbled that I get to sort of be that bridge and, you know, provide access. And, you know, I'm so passionate about providing access by just by removing boundaries. It's just about removing boundaries is creating opportunities, you know, my staff, I'll be honest, drive me crazy, but um, they're also some of my favorite people. And, you know, and, and and we promote community first. So it's a really an interesting sort of, I guess, set of values and it's informed all of our decisions and it's made us who we are today. And I'm really thrilled about one, making it through and surviving 2020. And I'm, I'm so excited about what the next couple of years are gonna bring us. So um, that's my three minutes. And thanks for reaching out. I see, I see Cass, I see Betty and Ellen, who's known me since I was, what, 14? Um, so, you know, I'm absolutely thrilled about what, what the sport can do. And I'm more excited about people wanting to participate in the change that we're talking about. So, thank you. Brandon, thank you. Thank you for your leadership, and we're excited to see what's to come as well. Um, I, think, I think we're all here because we know that, you know, exposure to this sport and taking part in it. Um, and, and, and it's hard to hear you. And we just want to change It's that. hard to hear you. All right, it must be my connection going. So I'm going to allow, I'm going to have Ellen say a few closing words, um, but then we'll open the floor. But I want her to get these words in before people start to leave. So Ellen. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all of you who have participated tonight. Uh, this was uh, an exceptional evening because there are so many exceptional women in this sport. Um, I think your stories and your participation will help the women of the row move to the next steps. Together we've heard about the challenges and the successes of the not too distant past and what so many of you have gone through to be able to do just something you wanted to do in a very male dominated sport. 
all because you wanted to row. We know now, and we, I guess we've always known what rowing can do for women. As we all have our own experiences and stories, we can help those that follow us uh, stand on our shoulders. We've learned about our sisters in the paddling community who brought the sport to the Schuylkill River and together the paddlers and the rowers can build a unique community of women that we all want to be a part of. This program, Women of the Row, is more relevant now than it's ever been. And we must remember the women, the history, the struggles, the fight for equality, begging for inclusion, and constantly working to prove ourselves. And we must make the connection between then and now as it relates to our diversity, inclusion, and equity efforts today. We have learned that we must continue to move forward and we must never, ever take anything for granted. There are multi-generations on this call and Brannon, unfortunately, that's why you went last. <laughs> You're the youngest. Um, I hope the messaging will encourage young women rowers to listen and continue to ask questions. I hope the generations will continue to learn from each other and mentor each other and support each other. We ask that you remember the people that helped us all out. The Christopher Blackwalls, the Jim Barkers, the Joanne Iversons, the Jack Kellys, and so many more who Anchor. mentioned throughout the evening. So what comes next? That depends on you and that depends on us. We still need photos of women on the walls of Boathouse Row. But we encourage you to reach out with your thoughts and your suggestions about future programming, about future service and community outreach programs that we can perform together. Your ideas are important about how we, as a powerful group, can make a difference together. We ask that you participate in our Facebook group and that you give us ideas and you offer your service to the women of the row so that we move forward in a positive manner and we really make a difference. We also encourage you to support each other. We encourage you to support Amanda Krauss and US Rowing so she can fulfill her dreams. We encourage you to support Brannon Johnson who, and her Boathouse Without Walls so that she can be successful and have her dream come true. We encourage you to support Bonnie Mueller, the third woman Commodore of the Schuylkill Navy, as she sets out to pave her way in a somewhat still male orientated community. And we encourage you to support PGRC and all, uh, buy all their wonderful uh, items that they're going to use to rebuild and refurbish their historic boathouse and so much more. Follow the, the paddlers and support their golf out, outing. Uh, there's so much we can do if we know what needs to be done. I just want to leave you with a couple of statements that I recently read that resonated with me. When women lead, we all win. And when women own, the pie gets bigger for everyone. So let's work together to build our future and to move on and to allow Women of the Row to achieve its mission with all of you and let's just keep moving forward. And thank you all so much for a great evening. And Jen, did you want to open the floor? Please, please. 
Okay, uh, are there any questions to any of the people in particular? Um, or anybody who just wants to share a story? Any, uh, any firsts or anything that you want to share as a result of this evening? Um, I'd, li I'd like to hear Lois tell her dad veil story. Oh, me too. <laughs> <laughs> She's on mute though. Come on, Lois. Unmute. I'm unmuting. I'm unmuting. Okay, uh, the year is 1973. We had just come back from Moscow and we were told, um, the national team, that we were all ambassadors for women rowing. Now, this is the beginning of Tattoo Mount 9, the first phase. And um, I said, okay, uh, to myself. And at the time, I was dating a gentleman who, had, who was a coach of LaSalle College. And um, I knew that the Dadville meeting at those days was the first Saturday in December at number four Boathouse Row. And in those days, the big, the big table was up on the second floor. So um, this gentleman and I, we went out to the movies Friday night, Saturday morning came up and um, meeting was to start, I don't know, eight o'clock or whatever. And uh, I come up the steps and he sees me and he looks at me and I go, and he goes, you know, and I sit down and then uh, Tom Conville, who, who was the um, uh, head honcho at the time, goes through the program and uh, he comes to new business. Now, what I had done the week before, I called Tom Conville and I asked if I could be put on the program as new, um, as new, uh, 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 new business and, um, uh, and uh, you know, to introduce, to have women row at the Dadville. I said, the Dadville's smaller budget program and there's only one trailer. And at that time, there were some colleges going off here, there, and they couldn't, they couldn't drive as much. And so he said to me, Loie, he called me Loie. Loie, he said, I have no problem with that. He said, but you're gonna have to row 2000 meters. I said, oh, that's great. No, we prefer to row 2000 meters because a thousand meters by then became a sprint. He said, okay. He says, I gotta warn you though, there's going to be maybe a coach that might give you some problems. And he said, uh, I said, oh, I said, uh, who is it? He said, George Hines. I said to him, don't worry, I'll take care of that. So the meeting starts and it was new business. And um, I made my pitch, you know, Title IX, we should row together, competition, et cetera, et cetera. And what Tom Conville said to me, and it's so true that I, what I know about George Hines, George Hines is black and white, there are no shades of gray. And he said, uh, he said um, he's a little bit of a chauvinist. Uh, the truth of the matter is he is, except when I'm around him, or except when he's around me. So um, I make my presentation and the vote is called. Well, George Hines just put his head down and we passed overwhelmingly. But the reason why he was called a chauvinist was the year before Notre Dame Road. And at that time, Notre Dame was an all male school, but they got their coxswain from across the street St. Mary's, which was a girl. So the program read basically Notre Dame and George protested. He protested and he protested, he said, because the agenda was wrong. It should have been Notre Dame slash St. Mary's. And if it had been that, Notre Dame wouldn't have gotten some point. I mean, it was a point choice. But I really thought it was quite funny, the poor man had no idea how he was going to be sort of ramshackled that morning. So, uh, and that year, 1973, um, it was passed that women could row in Dadville. And so I, I'm not sure, to be honest with you, I'm not sure if they rode in 74 because I think the entries had to be in, or was it 75? Uh, um, maybe you would know, Mar um, whoever rode in the first Dadville. Actually, I, thought it, I thought it was 78, but... 
No, no, no. It was sooner than that. It was right after. Right after that. But it was I know when I came back from Lois, Russia. it was one it was one event. It was the four. That was it, right? Right. I forget. I mean, I'll be honest, I have to go dig up the agenda. But but women were admitted into Dadville with uh with that date. Okay. Well, it was good fun. It was good fun that day. Yeah, it was a little victory for women. You know, we don't we don't think of our our accomplishments as victories. They're just common sense. And the most beautiful thing I'm experiencing now, being with so many young women um, at the Heinz Rowing Center, is that in some ways they don't know really what I'm talking about if I do talk. It's it's the world is their oyster. They can do what they want to do, whatever they want to do. And, uh, you know, I can, I can see it in their face. I can see it in their determination. And uh, I keep telling them that um, rowing is not a sport. It is a cult. And you will absorb it and you will keep it forever. And uh, so God bless you all. You're all wonderful. So are you. Thank you. Thank you for that. I don't know if my volume's still low. Anyone else that would like to to talk? Margo, I skipped over you. Do you want to uh, chat? Come on. I don't know if I can possibly top any of those. You can't make me go after all of that. <laughs> <laughs> I um, represent. <laughs> well, I, get, I can give my piece. Uh, my name is Margo Angelopoulos. I um, I'm, I'm an imposter here entirely, in, in part, as, as uh, others have said, I, I'm one who does stand on the shoulders of, of all of you, um, but also that I have no evidence of the history of my club and my, my role as being a first, but it, as far as we can imagine in my experience, um, this is true. So I'm a member of the Fairmount Rowing Association, and uh, for those of you that know Fairmount, uh, it is uh, generally thought of as the boys club. Uh, they've never uh, uh, directly uh, excluded women. They just never attracted women. I came to Philadelphia in 2010 uh, and sought out, uh, I came for grad school and uh, joined up with uh, UPenn's uh, Graduate Rowing Club. Um, just to, that was where I, where I landed. Uh, and they were tenants at Fairmount. So I had my foot in the door there. So when I graduated in uh, 2013, I just sort of uh, rolled into Fairmount and uh, had a, a coach who, who didn't think twice to start mixing me in. I was the only one that would uh, start uh, showing up, that I would show up to the men's practice. And then they would put me in miscellaneous boats wherever it seemed appropriate. Um, I was by no means the first woman at Fairmount. There were other women there, the likes of uh, Sarah Sargent and Molly Kanopka and Sheila Willeman and uh, Barbara Hogan was probably a member there. Uh, I am just, there's a mythical creature that I don't know if she's still on the call, Teresa Bell. There's a boat named after her in Fairmount. Um, I've never met you, so I would love to hear the story <laughs> of your time at Fairmount. But um, so I started showing up to the men's practices, uh, sort of one by one, got put in different boats. They figured out I was a decent rower. Uh, one day we had a land practice. They figured out I could pull hard and uh, it didn't hurt that I was 6'2". So they eventually didn't mind rowing with me. Um, but of, you know, the 140 members at Fairmount, there were probably six, six women there at the time. And the, the others all did, you know, they were out in their singles doing their own thing, not, you know, not even at the boathouse the same time as me. So I was the first um, that I'm aware of doing that. And during that process, I uh, made a strong effort to try and recruit other women to join me just so I could uh, train consistently and have someone to race with. And uh, with moderate success here and there, we did sort of get enough bodies to race and uh, may have uh, led the sort of charge as being the first sort of competitive group of women uh, in team boats at Fairmount uh, in 2015. We probably had what, the first team boat entry at the Charles in a four. And uh, two years ago, Fairmount's first ever boat entered in the San Diego Crew Classic. We put together an eight with some help some, for some members from other clubs, but uh, that was our, our big uh, epic uh, <laughs> racing story. So that's my story. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Thank you, Margo. Who else? Anybody else would like to add? Uh, hello, my name is Nancy Bocchino. This is my first uh, meeting of women on, the, women on the Row. It was wonderful. It was very nice. Uh, I just would like to share that I, along with several other, pe other people on this call, 
was in the first women's nationals team that won the uh, eight in 1966, which we're very proud. And um, I joined PGRC in 65, uh, a little bit after Sophie, and I guess uh, around the same time as uh, some of the others. Um, I was uh, visiting a friend whose husband coached uh, Monsignor Bonner Rowers. I got into conversation with him. I said, gee, that sounds like a wonderful thing to do. I, I think that'd be really interesting. He said, well, there's a girls club, you know, down at the boathouse. Well, and I said, no, I didn't know that. So um, I called and nobody answered the phone because as I know now, hardly uh, it, nobody's always in the boathouse. So I just knocked on the door and I think it was Nancy Mudrick who answered the door. I said, could I join? And she said, sure, and I came in. And I was really fortunate to get in the crew who uh, went to Penn, like Sophie said, and the, at the tanks to learn to row and um, went to the first women's national. That's great. Thank you, Nancy. Mm -hmm. Who's next? So feel free to jump in. Anybody? Okay. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll jump in. Hi. Um, you see, I can even get. So in 1969, a woman said to me, because I was dating her son, you should row. It'd be really fabulous if you could row. She said, but they don't let women in the, t in the club. But she said, let me talk to my husband. Let me see what we can do. And so that woman was Mary Colgan. And I never rowed then. And I was very glad 20, 25 years later uh, with Ellen Carver, came back to Vesper and we rode. And this is really great. And it's a wonderful group of women. And thank you so much for all of your work that you have done on the behalf of women and the need to, um, to do wonderful things, which is what we do. So thank you all. Thank you, Sue. And thank you, Sue. Anyone else like to share tonight? All right. Well, thank you all for coming out tonight. We know that the night ran late, but we tend to do that with, uh, with these events because uh, it's just difficult to end them um, because we have such a good time together. So we appreciate wait, wait, that. Wait, I first. Oh, hang on, hang oh, on. Oh. Hang on. Everybody. Jen is in line to be the first female president of University Barge Club. Yeah. So, there you go. It may take a couple of years, but. <laughs> I may decline it by that point. Uh, we'll see. Um, Al, I cannot, um, I, I cannot outdo uh, Ellen's closing words. And, and uh, Mara, Ellen, and I sincerely um, appreciate everyone coming out tonight. Um, you know, this, this group is very organic. It's gonna be exactly what all of you want it to be. Um, so what we hope that you will really uh, jump in and, um, and use this as a vehicle to, to keep us moving forward. Um, it's just so much, so much, you know, uh, there's so much surrounding us and I think we just need to keep lifting one, one another up. Um, you know, we have bumps, we have bad days, but, um, you know, as I say to my uh, my husband, you just hit those bad days on different days and just keep lifting each other up and uh, and we'll get there. Um, but just an amazing group of stories tonight and we're gonna keep sharing them. Uh, that, it, that is the goal um, to, to pass down uh, these, these legacies. And I know that you didn't set out to be pioneers, um, but you set out to do what you love and here we are and we're gonna keep moving forward. So thank you all very much. And please, um, we'll send out a follow-up email to everyone that, that came out tonight. Um, so we'd love to hear um, your thoughts and comments, um, you know, on tonight's presentation, but, it, but also just in general, you know, what you'd like to see out of the future and how you can get more involved. So appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Round of applause Thank for everybody. You. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful night. Stay safe, everybody. Thank you. Great evening. Great. See, see you on the water. A really wonderful program. Okay. There's more to come. <laughs>